Okay, hi everybody, and uh, you might not be expecting to see me, I'm at least at this hour, Wednesday at uh, uh, 12 o'clock Pacific, we're uh, 1 o'clock Mountain, uh, 3 o'clock Eastern, so we don't usually come on with a live program this hour, but uh, we've got a special program in store for you, and as you can see here on the screen, I've got William Henry with me as a special guest, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a proper introduction in a moment. But William, thank you for joining me here today. Appreciate it. My, thank you, Steve, very much. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. And uh, so viewers, as you could see there on the screen, as we were just coming into focus here, this we're going to talk to you about Ascension. So, uh, and boy, we've got uh, a very special guest here with you to talk about Ascension. We were just chatting a little bit in the green room before coming on uh, about his uh, background coming into this. But uh, let me let me give them a proper introduction, and then we're just going to jump right into questions and things. Uh, we do have uh, a green room opened up here for Humanity Stream Plus members, and we're also out on social media. Uh, so shout out to Humanities team members and people that are uh, that are friends of William Henry. So uh, thank you all for joining us. If you do have questions or comments that you'd like to bring to William, uh, throw them in social media, or if you're in the green room, just throw them there in the chat. And uh, we'll try and get to them here during this program. It's about a 30-minute program, but uh, uh, if you throw your questions at us early, we can, we can probably get to them. Okay, so let me introduce William here. He is the author of Ascension, uh, Divine Stories of Awakening the Whole and Holy Being Within, a book in the Common sci uh, Sentient series. He is an, an investigative mythologist, uh, art historian, and TV presenter. He is an internationally recognized authority on human spiritual potential, transformation, and ascension. He has a unique ability to incorporate historical, religious, spiritual, scientific, archeological, and other forms of such knowledge into factually based theories and conclusions that provide the layperson with a more in-depth understanding of the profound shift we are actually experiencing in our lifetime. The spiritual voice and consulting producer of the global his hit History Channel program, Ancient Aliens, and host of the Gaia TV series, The Awakened Soul, The Lost Science of Ascension, and uh, Arcunum, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, William. Uh, William mm -hmm. Henry uh, is your guide into the transformative sacred science of human ascension. So that's uh, quite impressive. You've uh, really got some pretty <laughs> substantial things under your belt there. William, and thanks again for joining me here today. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you once again for having me. So, uh, hey, let's jump right in here, and maybe we can start just uh, by talking about your book, Ascension. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with your book, what, what is that book about, William? The book is about the, the transformation that is that we're undergoing right now. We, we refer to it as ascension, which is basically a, an up leveling, a, a transformation of the human species. And what I wanted to do with the book is provide contemporary conscious ascenders with a uh, a timeline. There's there's a lot of people that I've, I communicate with regularly on social media, at events, and so forth that kind of got under the impression that Ascension was something new, something that's just begun in the past 20 years. And I realized that there was a, a gap in our understanding that, in fact, the, the human quest for Ascension actually goes back thousands of years. And what we're presently experiencing today is not a beginning. It's, in a way, more of a culmination of thousands of years of avatars and spiritual teachers injecting into human consciousness this idea that our life is to be devoted to transformation of ourselves into a higher frequency being, if you will, and also the transformation of human civilization and the uprising of our of our planet. So that's the, the need that I was trying to fill with the book is to show people that we're not really taking off as much as we are coming in for a landing. And that helps to put us on a little bit more solid ground than perhaps we would have if we're kind of not quite sure what this whole process of ascension is about. Boy, no kidding, uh, because I'm not sure that uh, everybody would, would immediately see that, that we're coming in for a landing, that we're not taking off. How, how did you, uh, in, in the introduction I was sharing, you know, you, you've uh, done investigative reporting historically, uh, looked mm -hmm. at these things, studied major religion, et cetera. How, how, how is it that you decided to 
to uh, focus on this and then become the scholar that you are on this kind of thing? Well, I started, well, I'm 60 years old, just turned 60. When I was 20, I started deeply researching the Gnostic Christian mysteries of human transformation into angelic beings. These are the, the parallel Christian mysteries, the one the mainstream church doesn't want you to know anything about. And I started to follow the, the path of the, the origins of those mysteries further and further back in time through ancient Egypt, into ancient Samaria, and even into the pre-flood world. And I began to realize that there's long, there's long been a presence on our planet that is seeking to infuse human consciousness with this understanding that we're sort of in a, in a transformational phase when we're in our human existence, that our human body is, is meant for something greater than just wandering around on our planet, using it as a, as a skin suit, if you will, that our body was in fact designed for ascension, and that if we start to seek the teachings about how we transform the body, it not only transforms us individually, but also collectively as well. Yeah, boy, those are uh, fascinating perspectives. Let me, let me. One thing you know that I immediately go to here, uh, William, in, in this is so as as you go into your personal life, you know, and just immediate benefits of of this, where you know, I'm guessing you live your life a completely different way than at 20 years old when you were just oh, yeah. like the rest of us, walking around unconscious, everything separate from everything. Uh, what are what are maybe a few of the things that are really just quite, quite different, you know, in terms of how you live your life now with this awareness that you have? Well, a couple of things immediately come to mind. One, when you get onto the ascension path, you are pretty quickly presented with the concept that our flesh and blood body isn't our true divine nature, that indwelling with all of us is a divine being, referred to as a light being, an angelic type of a being, and part of what has to happen on the ascension path is we have to flip from the recognition that this is me to that there's something behind the eyes. There's this, this light being within me that is, in fact, truly motivating all of my actions. And when we start to live our life from that perspective, we recognize the unity of all things. We, we more deeply uh, recognize the importance of, of karma, righteous actions, following the, the path of, of the, the previous righteous ones and recognizing that our life is precious, that this moment, this blink of an eye that we're experiencing, this human life is meant to be directed for more than accumulation of material objects. It's more meant to be for the accumulation of knowledge, wisdom, and ultimately to, to share that wisdom with others on the same path. Yeah, boy, I mean, these are all, so when we talk about the conscious journey, it is all of the things that you're sharing, you know, divinity, which is really loving presence, uh, everlasting mm -hmm. life. You know, it just isn't, there's not some, oh my God, I'm gonna die one day. That just didn't, <laughs> that's nowhere in this whole perspective. You know, it's more, what am I gonna do with this precious chapter of my life where I'm here now and where we all decided to come here now and it probably doesn't, doesn't take too long for us to decide, especially the viewers, you know, those of us that are conscious that we probably came here to be a part of this big pivot. It's uh, it's needed now. The the uh, Gaia is shouting out, you know, hey, I need your attention, uh, and and we do too. You know, living this life of separation where we've got ultimate reality all mixed up. Uh, this uh, Einstein uh, called it optical delusion. You know, it it doesn't. It's not fun living our lives that way. Right. And especially today, I mean, we're confronted with so many challenges, some of them self-inflicted, others of them perhaps more of a cosmic nature. But that also is what motivated me to to write this book, because ever since around the year 2000, I've been writing about and, and warning about the dangers of, for example, transhumanism or merger with AI and, and technology and the potential that that has for robbing the soul of its true capabilities and even hampering our ascension. So right now is, is the big, as you say, the big pivot, the big wake up, all of human history from henceforth and the, ultimately what happens to the human body will be determined by the decisions that you and I and all the viewers make and, and everyone else involved in this, in this scenario. It will depend on the decisions we make in the next five years. 
And part of my concern is, and one of the questions I raise in my numerous articles on my website, williamhenry.net, is can a trans human being ascend? Or is there something uniquely special about remaining purely organic and developing our organic ascension capabilities? And of course, personally, I believe that we need to remain organic and and shy away from the merger with AI and the, and the technology that's rapidly consuming our world. Boy, let's go deeper on, on this one, transhumanism, because we, we certainly couldn't agree more. Uh, it's uh, uh, a, a lot of what we hear from our partners and faculty is that where they're presenting, a lot of times youth will come up to them following a presentation and on transhumanism, they, their, their word for cool is sick. Of, wow, that is so sick, that transhumanism, the singularity, you know, all this stuff. Uh, so right. there's a certain appeal or sexiness to, to some, but boy, there's a tremendous danger. I mean, the thing is, is we're only beginning to understand our human capacities. I'm sure with Ascension, this is what you're sharing, right? We've got these human capacities that are just beyond uh, understanding right now. You're probably trying to, that's why you wrote the book, right? Is to educate people help them see who we yeah. are and what our potential is. Yeah, exactly, because for the past at least 3,000 years, the technological path and the organic ascension path have been running parallel, and it's now coming to an apex. It's coming to a moment where perhaps we can merge the, the organic and the inorganic or the digital, the AI, uh, on the ascension path. But again, I'm 99.999% I'm sure we don't want to do that but we still recognize that we live in this world. So I'm, I'm trying to help people to navigate uh, this, this gauntlet that we're in right now and, and choose the organic path because that ultimately is the one that all human beings can, can choose. If, they, if we're going down the technological path, chances are it's not gonna be for everyone. It'll be for a very uh, small elite part of the human population that will actually have access to that technology. Yeah, well, uh, certainly so true. So, so let me um, let me ask you this: as you travel around the world with this expertise that you have, uh, do uh, uh, do people immediately get the importance of ascension? And and if not, how do you help them to see the importance of of this uh, work that you do? You know, it's funny, Steve, you asked that because I, I, I've been teaching this for 20 years and, and talking about and in tandem with transhumanism and people until five years ago, uh, four years ago, be like, what are you talking about? What is this ascension business you're talking about? What is transhumanism? Never heard of this. But now it's becoming so apparent that that is the case and it's gone mainstream. And, and that is part of the transformation. And so, again, the important uh, aspect of this to me is to, to recognize that we have been a species, as we've been described as a species with amnesia. We've been up in the air. We've been floating around, uh, kind of in the ethers, wandering around spiritually. A few people, a few masters, avatars here and there, kind of understanding the concept of ascension and transformation. But now, as I say, it's like we're coming in for a landing. We're no longer up in the air. We're getting our feet on the ground and recognizing what it means to be a whole, holy and complete human being and recognizing that the mainstream structures that we've relied on for literally centuries, if not millennia, who have advocated the idea of ascension, perhaps aren't the ones that have the key to our ascension. They, in many ways, kept us locked in place, kept the, the gate to the higher realms closed. But now individuals in smaller communities are, are taking it upon themselves to seek out these mysteries, to seek out these ancient teachings and recognizing that it's, it's more of an individual process than it is a collective, this idea of ascension. And they're, they're starting to understand how it fits in with the yoga that they've been doing, the meditation, the dietary changes, the positive thinking, the visualization, all of these tools and practices are actually go leading somewhere. Ultimately, where they're leading is to, again, this state of greater wholeness or holiness that uh, culminates with our ascension as an individual as well as a species. Yeah, I get it. I mean, isn't it wonderful that there is this convergence going on right now that uh, when we talk about conscious living, which in, there's so many dimensions to this, but that we're all one, faces of the one, and the science is affirming this now, that it's a non-dual universe, science is also affirming this now the aspect of inner 
uh, that we, you know, we need to go within. If we don't go within, we go without. So some of these things yeah. are really now, maybe 20 years ago, these were, I'll call it more fringe, uh, Ascension 2, yeah. uh, they're, they're becoming less fringe. There's the sense that, my God, this is actually ultimate reality. I better pay attention. This isn't some side gig, you know. This is kind right. of what our exactly. life is about. So exactly. let me go and then to, you factor uh, in, yeah. like the prophecies, yeah. the book of Revelation describes a new human living in a new earth. And this is the basis for many of the ascension ideas that people talk about today. Shifting from 3D to 5D, for example, that that's right out of the book of Revelation. That's the origin of it. And when you track down the, the origin of it, it gives you a little bit more of a, a sense of uh, connection to the mystery. It's not just some individual person that's been that, that says this. It's actually a, 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 a series of prophets and in mystics and teachers that have been advocating this. And we recognize and start to see the signs in our world that yeah, the, the new human is here. It is us. The new earth is uh, unfolding and awakening all around us. And so once we have that, I, I feel that sort of timeline, that solidity, that, that reaffirms our purpose, that, that we're not just answering a call individually, that we're answering a call that has been been out there for a long time. And that, that gives us a sense, I think, of sense of confidence and also of support and also then tells us, well, there's a blueprint that, that's here. There's a plan. There isn't this isn't just randomly occurring. It's not a spontaneous ascension. This has been planned and there's more to come. And so as we get along this path and start recognizing where we've come from, we're more able to learn where we are going. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, it brings us right back around to where we started, that uh, we're coming in for a landing here. Uh, this is, thing isn't just taking off. So um, what of the ancient uh, ascension experiences do you find most fascinating uh, and, and resonate with, William? I really started, Steve, with the idea of the cloak or garment of light. And that's something that continues to just fascinate me and, and capture my imagination. Going back to the earliest human stories, there's this idea that humans originally were energetic light beings. And this, this status as a light being was symbolized by a garment of light. This was lost in the Judeo-Christian and Islamic tradition during the fall of man when we were evicted from Eden and found ourselves suddenly in these physical flesh and blood bodies. All of human history really is a quest to return to our original divine light being status and to acquire or reacquire this garment of light. And so 25 years ago, I started tracking that garment through all the world's religious and mythological traditions and learning about their teachings about how to acquire that how it's symbolized in artwork, and ultimately how it culminates in what we think of as an ascended being, as a luminous, humanoid, radiant being. And so that that, that garment of light really is the, the my key specialty in terms of understanding the, the, the history, the teachings, and the, the, the symbolism. Wow, that's fascinating. Where, what uh, kind of text then uh, did did, did uh, reveal this the the fuller story that you're talking about here, William? You know, it's 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 in the temple walls of Egypt. The Sumerians said uh, this garment of light was a gift from the Anunnaki gods. They 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 considered it to be an actual physical garment, but it's also a teaching. It's a it's a frequency or vibration that can transform an ordinary human into a divine being. Elijah, the 8th century Jewish prophet, possessed it. He passed it to his priest, Elisha. John, excuse me, Elijah then reincarnates as John the Baptist. He transmits it to his cousin, Jesus. Jesus demonstrates it in his transfiguration. When, when, you, when you start to follow it, you realize this is at the core. It's at the center of literally all the world's religious and spiritual traditions. The, it's called the coat of many colors. It's the rainbow light body of the Tibetan tradition. It's the crossed garment in ancient Egypt. Every spiritual and religious tradition speaks about this cloak or garment and the necessity of flesh and blood humans to acquire it in route to their ascension into uh, higher frequency realms. In other words, if you're going to enter the heavenly realms, you got to be dressed appropriately, and you got to, so that means you got to be wearing your garment of light. So you mentioned the rainbow light body. Uh, can we go a little deeper on that? And can anybody attain that, William? 
Yes. So the idea is that, and this is a, a not specifically a Tibetan tradition. I've I've tracked it into the, the Egyptian, the Christian, the Tibetan. It's really a cosmic teaching. Uh, and the idea is, is that our body was designed to have its frequency accelerated until the physical flesh and blood body dissolves into five colored rainbow light, leaving behind only hair, toe and fingernails, which have no nerves to be transmuted. And once we enter into this glory body, rainbow body, resurrection body, or light body, we're then able to, to uh, use a, a Star Trek term, beam ourselves to other dimensions, other planets, and then phase back into physicality. The, the reason why you want to pursue these mysteries, according to the Tibetans, is because it enables you to deliver greater compassion in whatever world you find yourself. So that's the motivation for pursuing the rainbow light body or resurrection body, is that it's going to make you a being of greater light and a being of greater love. And, uh, you know, just it happens. I, I started on this rainbow body path around 2004 when uh, people that work for the Dalai Lama and were specialists in the rainbow light body approached me at a conference and said that my work in Egypt answered questions for them about the rainbow light body that, Tibet, that the Tibetans wouldn't answer because they didn't know the answer or they did, couldn't answer because it was secret. And, and that is how does once a, a Lama or a practitioner, once they attain this rainbow light body and can phase into uh, that that light being status, and they can then travel to other dimension, other in other worlds. How do they get there? And I had been doing all this work in ancient Egypt about all the different references to portals and gateways and what we today call wormholes and sacred art on the temple walls. And they said that that that's the answer. That that's the missing piece about the the rainbow light body is that in fact our body itself is the wormhole our body is the portal and once we start to look at our human body from that perspective that instantly puts us on that that higher ascension path and we realize that the technology that we're seeking that for example high energy physics types are seeking today to open wormholes to travel to distant places in our galaxy or maybe even other dimensions that that, that technology that they're seeking is actually our human body we don't need starships to, to travel the stars. We're, we're sitting in one right now if we learn how to properly utilize it. And so that's been a, a, a big part of my research is to, to look at the body from that perspective as the portal from the, from the soul's perspective and what all these various traditions say about how we transform our body, how we become more whole, more holy com or complete, or the word that Tibetans use for the rainbow light body is more perfect which means to be more compassionate. Yeah, boy, that's right. More loving, more compassionate. Wow, that is fascinating. Um, and of course, um, you know, we're all familiar with multi that we're multidimensional beings, which gets into what we're talking about here. We're not, which means we're not just here present now. We're present. There's right. no such thing as time. There's only this, uh, the, the present moment of time, actually. Right. And, which means that Perception. we're everywhere all at once so we're ascension that you're talking about is where we're learning to be present into these multiple uh dimensions that is is part of actually all of our profiles and identities isn't it absolutely and that that's one of the central teachings of the great perfection or tibetan rainbow light body teaching is that you've already achieved that state and you've just covered it over with negative perception false perception attachment to the physical body and really samsara it's just it's it's an illusion and once we start to seek that aspect of ourselves it begins to reveal it and i, I always and i talk about this in uh, my ascension book i people ask well how do you attain the rainbow light body and the, the the simple answer and which is the most powerful to me comes from michelangelo who was asked by an apprentice master how are you going to sculpt an angel out of that block of stone and he said something to the effect that I'm going to look at that block of marble and I'm going to remove everything that doesn't have to do with the angel. And I'm going to set the angel free. And that's part of the challenge all of us have is to look at our lives and say, what, what, am, I, what am I doing in my life? And does that actually serve my ascension? Does it serve my ability to manifest or reveal my true divine nature? 
If not, it's it's perhaps a, a, a better decision to start letting those things go. And in the example of Michelangelo, if we if we let go of the the things that are our blocks in, in the marble example, the angel will be all that's left. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so and it's really just. You could another way of, of talking about this is following our soul's calling because we're the soul is in control and we're not trying to go to the mind but we're feeling more into the journey and just letting the doors open and doors close that the soul draws us to then right. uh, everything just falls into place so magically and beautifully uh, so ascension experiences I'm, I'm fascinated by this so and i know you write about this and i'm sure in your own life you experience this can can you uh, tell us about like ascension experiences that you like uh, uh, that uh, would be really even bring more description to kind of how this works. Yeah, uh, my, in my own experience, uh, the first time I was in the Great Pyramid in Egypt 20, 25 years ago, I, I knew the Great Pyramid was an ascension instrument. That's that's what the, the academics say. That's what the ancient Egyptian belief was, is that it was a, a hardware device, if you will. The pyramid text, the world's oldest religious text, 3,500 years old, are the software. And they tell of the Pharaoh ascending the stairway to heaven. The, the Pharaoh became a star. The, the Pharaoh became like a flash of lightning, which means if he's flash of lightning or he's a star, he's become a plasma being. So we're, we're talking about taking our, our flesh and blood body and trans, transferring it into a, a plasma state, transforming it into a, a plasma state like a star. And so I had that awareness. But in this first visit to the Great Pyramid, I was sitting in the king's chamber and just meditating, had my eyes closed, think about where I'm at, the most powerful building in the world, center of the land masses. So I just start sending love out to my my family and friends back home and, and love all around the world. And all of a sudden, this blue eye comes out of nowhere and it's beaming bliss at me. And I didn't know what it was. And it was only when I left the pyramid did I learn that it was called the blue eye of Horus. And I, then I started to see depictions of the Great Pyramid with the blue eye of Horus exactly in the location of the king's chamber. And I realized at that moment that I had come into conscious awareness or contact with what I term the intelligence behind the pyramid. And I, that really began my quest for ascension was to, to unpack what must have been downloaded to me at that moment about not only the, the Great Pyramid on Earth, but other civilizations where we find uh, these these teachings are, are offered, where pyramids are most certainly built. And, and what is the consciousness behind uh, the Great Pyramid? And I soon very quickly began to realize it had to do with ascension, the codes of ascension, human transformation into celestial beings, and ultimately harnessing the power of the body as uh, the stairway to heaven itself. Wow, what a fascinating experience that must have been. Yeah, and then yeah, to nice. spend that quality yeah. time, you know, kind of peeling the onion back on what did this mean? <laughs> right. Wow, extraordinary. And do you, uh, in the programs that you lead, do does, is, does this happen with any frequency where people can experience something that's just astounding like that? Absolutely. You know, it's there's so many different tools that are available today. Wonderful meditation programs, visualization. Um, people are now experimenting with dimethyltryptamine, DMT, MDMA, other uh, synthetic uh, substances, molecules that are triggering these deep states of love. And they're actually encountering light beings while they're using these substances. So uh, these these are ancient teachings and ancient tools that are now coming into our awareness today. And so ascension practitioners today have at their fingertips a, a whole host of tools that were mostly kept secret for millennia and now are, are actually going mainstream and so what i encourage people to do is to to really think about ascension not as a going somewhere type of an idea but rather as a quest for becoming more whole and more holy 
And all of us, I think, probably have an idea in our mind of ways that we can become more righteous, become more whole beings, things that we need to work on to heal ourselves and and ways that we can just, in its very essence, improve ourselves. But the problem is we're often procrastinating. And I encourage people to start with those things that you're procrastinating on. And the idea is, is that we're already those whole beings. And as you start to do these new things that you've been perhaps procrastinating on, that whole and holy you just manifests. And start with the easy things. Get a snowball effect going. Gently start raising your frequency. It's not an all-at-once process. It's an ongoing unfolding, if you will. The key thing is, is to start and then also to be consistent with it, but also to have a vision of what that that end aspect of yourself will look like and feel like and then begin to do the things that encourage that that feeling of that wholeness and holiness yeah boy i love that the whole and holiness which is what uh, that's the staple of life here when we're living consciously uh where it's really what it's all we can do is the whole and holy thing where we're playing our particular role bringing our particular right. gift from our particular diversity to the Gaia and the and and humankind around us, so beautiful. Well, so William, as we uh, wrap up here, where where do we go from here? You know, as we talk about ascension, where, what are as we as we look out into the months and years ahead, where do we go from here? Well, I think what part of the ascension, when you when you look at it from the perspective of those who really inaugurated this process of ascension is that it, it's more of a, a connection with beings from out there that are coming here. Humanity isn't necessarily going somewhere. Earth is going to be the nexus of a gathering of avatars, ascended beings, and, and more divine beings. And so part of what we're doing now is setting up that base frequency on Earth where these these other beings can come to dwell here and this is where it now interfaces with what's happening with ufo disclosure um, angelic revelation book of revelation second coming type of conversations and the avatar idea of course isn't solely christian it's found in many of the world's uh, spiritual and religious traditions and so that's what i encourage people to focus on is what we can do to make earth more like heaven because that is going to ultimately be the, the what is going to accelerate our transformation and our our union or reunion with the beings that are gathering here now. Yeah, yeah, amen. Well, it's all about uh, creating uh, health and healing and well-being and really creating the sustainable, flourishing Earth that uh, uh, maybe was always the invitation, but we're, we're we maybe we missed the point here and which is why we have these challenges out in the world, but increasing sure. numbers of people are awakening and kind of seeing what, uh, what, what ultimate reality really is. It's not the optical delusion, you know, without that kind of, that gets cleared up and we see, oh my God, we're, you know, we are actually deeply interconnected, interrelated with not only those around us, but the entirety of the cosmos. And then a lot of the things that you're bringing in uh, start to fall into place here, don't they? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you. So, William, again, can you share for people that uh, want to follow your work? And I know you're going out to California. You're going to be presenting with a bunch of other uh, 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 thought leaders. You want to maybe just share a little bit about your website and the event that's coming up. And also in Nashville, I think you've got one in California and Nashville coming up. I do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll be uh, my website is WilliamHenry.net. Uh, this weekend, January 13th through the 15th, 2023, I'll be in San Diego for the Conference for Consciousness and Human Evolution with Greg Braden, Nassim Harriman, Bruce Lipton, others, uh, Dr. Uh, J.J. Hurtock and, and Desiree Hurtock, um, uh, among others. And then uh, my next big event will be in Nashville on April uh, 14th and 15th, which is devoted to the Ascension teachings of Mary Magdalene. I, I focus heavily on understanding the divine feminine aspect of this, in particular, the what Mary Magdalene taught about ascension. And I'll be sharing that during that weekend. Fascinating. Well, uh, so check it out, WilliamHenry.net. And uh, uh, William, we look forward to having you back. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, really appreciate it. Viewers, thanks for tuning in. And uh, we're actually taking off next week. 
Uh, but the following week, we'll be back with uh, Andrew Harvey on uh, Wednesday uh, at our normal time, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern. So uh, join us week after next uh, with Andrew Harvey, and uh, we're going to uh, pick up on other uh, real uh, fascinating and important conscious living topics. Okay, William, thank you. And we look forward to uh, partnering you. with you as we go into the future. Thanks very thank much, my so friend. Much. Thanks, viewers. Yeah. And uh, have, a, uh, have a fantastic day. Peace and love and blessings. Yeah.